I want you to turn your Bibles very quickly to the book of John. The book of John chapter 14, and we're going to look at verse 21. John chapter 14, verse 21. Our premise is going off of last week. In the book of Exodus, Joseph, having been blessed and favored of God and had all these great things going on, Joseph passes away, and shortly thereafter, the Bible says in Exodus chapter 1 that there arose a new Pharaoh, and that Pharaoh forgot about Joseph and all of his descendants. And because of that, three or four verses, three or four verses later, it was many years later, but because they forgot God, because the men forgot who they were, it's only a few verses that Egypt is literally coming into the homes to kill the boys. And so you see, when men forget God, Egypt forgets about men. And then they come and they steal our children. So what we need to do is be unforgettable. John chapter 14, verse 21. He that has my commandments and keeps them He is it that loves me, and he that loves me shall be loved of my Father, and I will love him and will manifest myself to him. Father, we love you, and we bless you, and we praise you, and we thank you for this day. We thank you for what you're doing, and we thank you for what you're going to do. We bless you, and we rebuke anything that is not of you, every distraction, mentally, emotionally, and spiritually, that, Father God, your word would go forth in power to bring about your will, in Jesus' name. Before you sit down, put your left hand over your heart. Extend your right hand towards me. I want you to pray this prayer, and I want you to mean it. Say, Dear Jesus, Jesus. say, Dear Jesus, Jesus. right now, now, I declare declare that my heart heart is good ground, ground. and I receive receive your word today today with joy, joy. and it will produce... Maximum fruit in my family, in my life, in my church, and in my ministry. In Jesus' name, amen. Give the Lord a hand clap in his house. All right, you may be seated. Let's get ahead, go ahead and start this thing out. What time is it? 11.4? Oh, I got plenty of time. Okay, let's get into this right now. All right, I was going to give like a, you know, a, a message on Father's Day, and I had kind of the outline planned out. And I kind of had my, you know, couple points and get home to start my own barbecue. But we had a thing called a friendship group at our house on Friday night. And friendship groups will begin throughout the whole church beginning next month. A friendship group is like a mini Wednesday night service where you host people at your house and you do just basically three things. We want you to bring food and eat it. I know some of y'all have a PhD in that. (laughs) Bring food, fellowship, and then pray. Very simple, very easy. And so in doing that, we had our friendship group and God moved. Like I said, we'll begin others in, in the remainder of this year. But then the Lord's been putting on my heart that there's 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 a spirit of I don't want to get married that this generation deals with. No one wants to say amen right. All right. There's this spirit of, I don't know if I'm ready to get married. I don't know if that's what it is. You know, and, and, and really, really, it's initiated by men. I'm going to get into that a little bit later, but, but this is what, what, what prompted me to switch my message up a little bit. There was three young ladies, and it, and, it, and it was put on my heart to pray. You know what? I'm going to pray that God sends you the right ones. And this is what I said, not thinking. I said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pray that God sends you the right boys. And they quickly, quickly corrected me. Pastor, we don't need boys. We need you to send, we need God to send us men. And I heard that in a different place than I said it. You know what I mean? I said it just as if I'm just going to pray, but they said, no, 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 no. If we're going to pray, let's pray right. And when I heard that, I said, man, isn't that the cry of women and culture today? Isn't that the cry of families and children today? 
Isn't that the cry of what the church is? Stop sending us boys and send us men. And if I can, if I can point something out to you, John chapter 14, verse 21 is a masculine verse. In Bible college, you are taught the principle of repetition. And here in this one verse, there is a masculine noun or adjective mentioned six times. In the scripture, six is the number of man. So 1421 mentions him, he, himself, father, six times. And, and, and the word that Jesus concludes with is the word manifest. Basically, the, the revealing of something. Let me get into this a little bit. We use the word creator for God, right? Right? And he is a creator. But, but really, the idea is not him creating something the way we think something is created. We think something is created by here's the top or here's the wood, here's the screws, and someone with some talent that I don't have can create something out of other materials. God doesn't create that way. How come? Because he had no other materials other than in himself to use. He did not use outside resources. He revealed what was in him so what was on the inside already became visible on the outside. So he didn't just create it. He manifested it. It was what was invisible was now visible. What was inside of him was manifested so that everyone could, could, could see it. Amen. And what he's saying here to his male disciples is that if you follow me, there's something in you you can't see. Amen. Write this down in your papers. Being male is natural, but being a man is spiritual. You were born a male, but you have to get the man revealed. God has to work in there and start pulling that man out. Some people see it, some people don't see it, and there's a myriad of different ways to repress that spiritual man, but God wants to manifest the man that he's created you to be. God wants the thing that is in you to start coming out of you. God wants the thing that he's designed inside to be revealed on the outside. And not only is he waiting for that man to be revealed, people around you are waiting for that man to be revealed. There's people around you that are waiting for that man God created you to be to be fully revealed. All right, okay, okay, okay. And I believe there are five steps and ways and, and, and principles that God uses to reveal the man. You're always the male, but as you walk through these things, the man begins to come out. And, and, and before I get too deep into this, I have to confess something to you. When I heard the girl say, Pastor, we don't want boys, we want men, and I kind of felt like I needed to retool my message, I realized that most of the things I'm going to be sharing with you, I have not learned from my great successes, but I've really learned from my failures. I've really learned this is what I thought thought this was, but that really didn't work out. This is what God was doing. This is what I may have been told was the way to be a man. That didn't work out really well, so I switched it up, and I did something else. And everything that we're going to share is not something I can tell you from a, a podium of victory, but really through going through defeats. But hopefully, we learn our lesson. And we can flip the script and start doing some other things. The first thing you need to do to be a man, the first thing every man needs to be, and these are in succession, but they're not in chronological order. And everything that I'm going to say, I know that the Holy Spirit is going to speak to you 
And whenever you say something, if you feel offended, if you feel that's not me, if you feel how dare he, that is definitely you, for you, absolutely, God is speaking to you. All right. The first thing every man needs, the first article, the first foundation of faith itself, every man needs this thing called submission. Every man needs to learn how to submit. If you, uh, that, that was empty, that means I, I got some people that are a little bit resistant. That's okay. You need to learn to submit to somebody. Your life will not go right unless you learn to submit to somebody. I, I used to teach here at Sunnybrook, and I've taught different places, been in the ministry, and you always get that man, you know, that young guy who comes and he's, he's complaining about the people in his life. My mom, and then lists some things that are wrong with the mom. And you hear, oh, man, that's, that's tough. Well, my teacher, and then you list the thing about the teacher. And then you hear, well, my coach kicked me off the team. My employer is an idiot. And pretty soon you have this language that somebody's speaking that everybody else is a moron except me. And I used to hear those stories with a little bit of a bleeding heart, but then I had to realize, no, 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 no. The problem possibly is not with everybody else. The problem is possibly with you. It's probably you don't know how to submit. In the military, in any training, the first thing they teach you before they teach you a skill is you better learn how to submit. When you get an order, you better learn how to say, yes, sir, that I'm going to do it. I'm not going to question it. I'm going to shut my mouth and get the job done. Learn how to submit. There's a difference in coming to church and being submitted to a kingdom. There's a difference between coming to a church and being submitted to a man of God. People say, oh, I go to that church. That's fine, but are you submitted? Because God doesn't go through attendance. He goes through submission. Well, well Pastor, I don't submit to any man. That's unbiblical. That's not, that's not biblical. That's actually Satan's kingdom. Satan is the kingdom that doesn't submit to anybody. God wants you submitted to everybody. God thinks submission is so important and vital and built on the life of the revelation of a man that he puts the, the honor your father and mother in the same edict as he puts don't kill somebody. If you don't learn how to submit, you will not function in life. Jesus just preached the Sermon on the Mount, the greatest speech, sermon, whatever you want to say, in human history. All of Western civilization, our government, our nation is based on the principles pulled from that message. So he preaches that in Matthew chapter 4, 5, and 6, and then he gets to Matthew chapter 7, heals somebody, and he's coming down, and you remember this story because I talk about it often. He's coming down, and, and, a, and a centurion. A centurion would have looked different than the crowd. A centurion is in the whole Roman gear. He's got a sword. He's got muscles. He's got the whole thing going on. And everybody in Israel is looking at this guy like, do not be in, in a position to get this guy upset because he could literally throw you in prison, kill you. No one would do anything. They were all in submission to him without being in submission to him. And he comes and all of these peasants and all of these villagers that all pretty much look like Jesus, and he's a Roman, and he comes to Jesus and says, hey, I have something to say. I would like to get an ear. I would like an audience with you. What can I do for you? My servant is back at the house dying of a sickness, and I cannot heal them, but I know you can. Jesus then says, you know what? I can. Wow, this is awesome. I'll go to the house and I'll heal him. I don't need you to go to the house. Hold up. I understand submission. All you have to do is speak the word. I know who you are. I know who you are. These other people obviously don't know who you are, but I know who you are. You're like me. 
if I am wanting something done, if I've got to go do it, somebody's going to be in trouble. I speak the word and men do it. I speak the word and they're in submission. You are not, I don't know if you're a teacher or a prophet. I think you're the Lord. I'm submitted to your lordship. And if you speak the word, my thing will be healed. My, my servant will be healed. And Jesus, the only time in the New Testament, said, holy. Can you, you see this guy? This guy gets it. One sermon and this Samaritan, this, this heathen, this Roman, he gets it completely. Faith is connected to submission. If you don't know how to submit, you don't know how to believe. Well, Pastor, I can't, I can't put my faith in man. Paul said it this way. Follow me as I follow Christ. I'm submitted to you as long as you're submitted to Christ. And one of the things that the church is doing is growing by attendance without anybody being in submission to anybody. And there's no real spiritual growth other than I'm attending this. Submission, submission, submission. Second thing, learn to stay. If you're a man, you got to learn to stay. You got to learn to stay. Pastor, you don't know how crazy my wife gets. I bet I do. Pastor, you don't know what, what she says and how she acts and what she does. I bet I do. There's this condemnation and judgment, and, and many of, many, a lot of it's right, that is put towards women because of abortion. Abortion kills a life. But a man who leaves his family aborts that whole family. Abortion kills the life of an individual. But when a father leaves, he kills the destiny of a whole group. And when that boy, can I, can I get into this a little bit? When that father is absent when that father is always leaving, when that father has vacated his position, something fills it. But the, that, that thing that fills it, as a, as, a, as a boy is growing up, as a young man is maturing, getting his own relationships, you follow me here? If he has a, a, a father that left, see, fathers have a way of leaving, and then mothers have to take the role and the responsibility of the father's. I've got to take on the financial responsibilities. I've got to take on the, the emotional and the educational and the protect, all of that. And when the woman takes those responsibilities on and the man has left, the boys that grow up underneath that dynamic aren't looking for a wife. They're looking for a mother. They're not trying to get a woman to be their wives. They're just trying to get a woman to mother them. Just take care of me. And that's why those relationships don't last a long time because I can only be in a relationship with a mother figure so long. But then when you leave that one, you don't go to find some. You are consistently looking for a mother and not man enough to look for a wife. Well, we're living with each other. How long y'all been doing that? Well, nine years. That's not a reflection of the woman. That's a reflection of the man. I don't know how to step into a role that I've never seen modeled in front of me. I don't know how to be that thing I'm supposed to be because the thing that I looked at was completely wrong and I've rejected that and, and I don't know how to, how to be who I'm supposed to be. One of the ways that God will train you to be who you're supposed to be, you got to learn how to stay. No one's amening right I'm arguing, you You better get out of here, I'm going to call the cops. 
you know what, I'm going to stay here. Go ahead and call me. The first time ain't going to be the last time, but I'm not leaving anymore. The Bible says this, if the unbeliever in a relationship leave, let him go, but we don't leave. No, we're staying right here. I'm staying right here. You can keep yelling. You can keep fitting. You can do whatever you want. I may go to one side of the house. You may go to one other side of the house. We may need to pray this thing out. But one thing you're not going to see me do anymore is leave. I'm a man. This is my house. You are my wife. This is my family. I can tell you one thing. Jesus modeled manhood more than anybody else when he said this to a group of disciples that were flaky until they got the Holy Ghost. This is what he said. He said, I will never leave you or forsake you. I stay. How many of you like me? How many of you like me can say, I've left the Lord multiple times, but he never left me. I took a hundred steps away from him, but when I turned around and took a step toward him, there he was right there. How come? Because I can say I left, but I can also say he never left. The Lord stays, and you as a man, you are a reflection of God to your family, and no matter how bad it gets, we stay. No matter how it gets in church, we stay. No matter how, how it gets in the money, we stay. Everybody else is leaving, I'm staying. Oh, you better say amen better than that. I know where I'm preaching at because men have a natural gift to leave. Uh-uh, this ain't feeling right. This ain't feeling right. We got two kids. We got payments. We got credit. We got it. Now it's not feeling right. No, 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 Papa. You better plant yourself like a tree in the living room. We're going to stay through this. And one of the reasons that wealth doesn't grow, that in the, most, in, the, in the wealthiest nation in the history of the world where we have poverty is because men leave and are leaving. And they leave a group of people behind them in their wake that are searching for something. You got to learn how to stay. If you're going to follow the Lord and be the man that God's called you to be, you got to learn how to serve. You want to know how to get promoted at your job? You want to know how to make more money? Nobody does. Okay, is there somebody maybe in the back? Frank, you do? Okay, I appreciate you, Frank. Okay, I'm going to talk to you. You want to learn how to be on the good side of people. You want to learn how to be in a position where you can begin to flourish. Start serving. Learn how to serve. I, I'm, not gonna, I'm not going to dismiss education because an education is critical and crucial to the growth of any individual. But the way that we have structured the educational system in our nation is absolutely backwards, upside down, and it is not producing people that are more intelligent. It's actually producing people that are completely ignorant. And why I'm saying that is we give this idea, if you go to college, get $150,000 to $190,000 in debt, and, and, which means you're going to be paying a house payment for the next 25 years, this, you, you, that's going to help you get this job. I'm, I, I'm all for college. I'm all for college. But if you learn how to serve, you'll start passing people up. You'll start leaving them in your wake. When, when you know how to serve, when the boss knows when something needs to get done, Greg is the man to go to. Somebody else can have his degree, and you have a heart of servanthood. You will serve your way all the way to the top. What do you want me to do? How can I help you? What do you want... Can I serve you? When, when you learn how to serve, when you learn how to serve, can, can we get PG-13? Amen. Learn how to serve your wife. Mm -hmm. This is what I learned early on in my marriage. Again, mistakes. Just PG-13. Women wear silky garments, flowing outfits with low cuts and high slits. Just the conversation is already getting me in a certain place. You know what I'm saying? The way that I feel when my wife puts one of those things on, I realized is the way she feels when I have a broom in my hand. 
It's weird. It's, it's weird. It was by accident. I figured it out. But one day, and, and, and I'm the most undomesticated. I don't know how to do anything. I'm not kidding. You think, I'm, you think it's a joke. I don't know how to wash clothes. I don't know how to iron nothing. But when I said, you know what, I'll, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to sweep this thing. Really? Mm. You know what? I'm going to do a dish. I can't do dishes, but I'm going to do a dish, right? Really? I need to talk to you real quick, me? Wait, what are you talking about? Yeah, come on over here. Hold up. I'm going to mop this floor. Get out of my way. I'm going to show you what's up. If you start serving, oh, look, don't let anybody tell you anything. Go out and cut that grass. Go out and cut that grass. Go out and straighten up that house. Go out and make that bed. Go out. No, 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 baby. I'm going to get this diaper for you. No, no, no. Push that away. No, no. I'm going to take care of this. I never changed the diaper in my life before my own children. I would mess that thing up backwards, upside down. But I started realizing I get blessed when I serve. Let me get just a little bit deeper here. And that's why pornography is such poison. Pornography is such poison because it teaches men that sexuality is about 100% my needs and not about her needs at all. And I'm going to tell you something. If you are having an issue in your physical relationship in your marriage, do something that is mind-blowing. I'm going to start serving my wife. No one wants to say amen. I'm going to throw away. Tom Cruise doesn't know how to be married. Brad Pitt don't know how to be married. All these people don't. They can't stay married. I've been married 30 years. I learned a few things. And I'm telling you, when it becomes that time when you make it about I'm going to serve your needs, all of a sudden her whole attitude about that will completely change. Well, Pastor, I don't know. I'm going to throw some things at you because I like you. Then ask, sweetheart, do you like this? No, I do not like that, and I'm glad you brought that up. Don't ever do that again. Well, what do you like? I'm glad you asked. I like this, this, this. I do not like this, and I do like that. And then, hey, listen, okay, well, guess what? I'm here to serve. Let's get that list out and start working on it right now. You, wait, hold up. Don't get, I'm off the floor already. Let's go you got to learn how to serve. And I'm going to tell you something. If you don't know how to serve in the bedroom, you're not going to learn how to serve anywhere. If you don't know how to serve in the easiest place that you can serve, you won't serve anything. And it is not manhood or masculinity that everybody is serving you. Masculinity is I am serving everyone in this house. Everybody in this house. Which brings us to the next one. You have to learn how to sacrifice. I'm, gonna t- I'm just going to tell you a little story. I remember a pastor friend of mine saying, he was saying on Father's, I mean on Mother's Day, you know, they had a big thing. And, and, and then on, they, gave, they gave, on Mother's Day, they gave away roses. And um, on Father's Day, they decided, well, we got to do something for the dads. Let's pin a corsage on their, on their, on their, on their, their jackets. And, uh, or their shirts. So, so they're doing that, and the service ends, and it's time to start pinning the corsages on the men. And so the fathers come up, and they pin the corsage. And the pastor said one of the boys who didn't have a father pinned the corsage on him and said, you're, you're like my father. And then a couple of the other young guys and then a couple of the men did the same thing. The problem was this. The boy didn't know how to put the pin on. And, you know, corsages can be a challenge. So actually, he didn't put the pin on. He stuck the guy, right? And then it, we, we, men don't put corsages on. That's not, I've been on dates, and the smartest thing you could ever do when you have something for the woman, give it to her and say, you go ahead and do this. I'm not going to do anything. I'm just going to drive us to the thing, everything from here. I put it, no, it doesn't go here. It goes here. And then you put it on here. No, it doesn't go here. It goes here. And you, whatever. Sacrifice. And when you learn to sacrifice, it's a lot like, the pastor who is getting these corsages pinned on him, on the outside, it looks nice, like he's getting an honor. But when he got back, 
He took off his jacket and his shirt. He's all filled with blood. Because serving and sacrificing sometimes means that I'm doing things looking one way on the outside while I feel another way on the inside. I am doing something with the idea that I am expecting something to go one way and it's not. And me loving you and me serving you and me staying here is going to cause me pain. But you have to realize that you were built for that kind of pain and you were built for that kind of pressure. You were built to stay in there and those pressures and that pain that you get from from having the corsages of life pinned on you by people with good intentions but bad, bad practical applications, sometimes it's a sacrifice. And God sees it and he blesses it. What, what, what God doesn't bless is when you try to keep the pain off of you and walk away and leave the corsage on the floor because this was just too much. God does not bless that. Amen. Learn how to sacrifice. Sometimes, as a man, you got to learn to start over. The first marriage didn't work out. The business didn't work out. My relationship with the Lord, I messed that up. I got divorced. I lost my money. I lost my position. I had something going on, and then I didn't. And then I got away from church for so long, and now I don't know how to get back. There is a skill to starting over. Come on, somebody. There's a skill to starting over. I blew the relationship. I need to start this over again. I love this about the Lord, that he tells us that my mercies are new every single morning. Great is my faithfulness. I'm going to help you get to where you need to go. And, And if you start looking at the scripture, it's a bunch of men that knew how to start over. Adam started off in the garden, but he got kicked out and he had to start over. Noah thought everything was going good, and then God told him, no, everything is going pretty bad. Get in the boat. I'm about to destroy everything. And then when he gets there, he has his own issues. He had to learn how to start over. Abraham had lived his whole life. Abraham was 80 years old, and God told him, listen, I've got something else for you to do. It's time for you to start over. Moses, I know you've been running away. You're 80 years old. You're ready to, to, to kind of get into the retirement years. But I got a plan for you, man. It, it, it's time for you actually to start over. David, I know you wrecked your whole life, wrecked the whole family, but you know what? I'm going to teach you how to start over. Jesus even knew how to start over. Crucified, buried, died but then he resurrected on the third day and he began to start over that which he did we don't call it starting over we call it restoring what God originally wanted to give you and if you get in the position where you start saying all right Lord I have had certain failures in my life but it's time for me to start over It's time for me to start over. I'm going to start over being the dad that I need to be. I'm going to start over being the husband I need to be. I'm going to start over and and, and, and marry this this girl that's been waiting for me for nine years. I'm going to start over by doing the things the right way. I'm going to do a... And God loves start overs. Come on, somebody. God loves startovers. He loves it. I'm going to leave you with this verse. It's in a book of the Old Testament that is written as the Old Testament time is coming to a close. The people of God have actually been taken again into slavery and brought into Babylon, and now they've come back. But when they've come back, what they left was not what they were coming back to. What they left was a temple and houses and 
beautiful cities and farms, and now they're coming back and everything seems to be in ruin. And that's a very difficult thing when you're trying to start over because God's telling you to do something, and as you're doing it, it's, it's completely and totally more difficult than you ever expected it to be. But they get back there, and God begins to speak to them. He begins to speak to them. And as he begins to speak to them, this is a promise he tells them as they're trying to start over. God says, this is what the God of the angel armies say. Before you know it, I will shake up the sky, the earth, the ocean, and the fields, and I'll shake down all of these godless nations around you. They will bring you bushels of wealth, and I will fill this temple with splendor, the Lord says. I own the silver. I own the gold, God says. Listen to this. Haggai chapter 2, verse 8 and 9. Haggai chapter 2, verse 8 and 9. This temple is going to end up far better than it started out. A glorious beginning, but even a more glorious finish. A place in which I will hand out wholeness and holiness decrees the God of angel armies. Haggai chapter 2 verse 9 says, The latter will be greater than the former. The latter will be greater than the former. I'm going to bless the start over more than I did when you were originally with me. I'm going to bless the end more than I did the beginning. Not that the beginning was bad. The beginning was fine. It was what it was. But I'm going to bless you at the end. I'm going to bless the start over more than I did before you even fell off. I'm going to pour out my spirit on you and your kids and your families more now than I ever have before. The thing that you are looking for, you're not going to see. Well, what are we going to see, Lord? You're going to see something better. You're going to see something stronger. You're going to see what I do is going to be better at the end than it was at the beginning. God wants to make this next phase of your life as a father, as a dad, as a family. God wants to make this next phase of your life as a servant of the Lord the most memorable and most blessed part that you ever had. What do you need to do? What's your Roll in this. Learn how to submit. Amen. Learn how to serve. Learn how to stay. Learn how to sacrifice. And learn how to start over when God is calling you to do something. Father, we bless you and we love you and we declare your goodness and your grace. We declare, Lord God, that your favor is on us and that your calling is in us. And we pray right now in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ that you give these men the grace to stay, the grace to submit, the grace to start over, the grace to sacrifice. Lord God, you're going to give these men the grace to do what you're calling them to do. I'm going to make a quick announcement very quickly because as I was getting these things together, I felt like I woke up one morning and the Lord was speaking to me, basically saying, don't go past this. You need to get deeper into this. Beginning on Monday, listen to me, men. Beginning on Monday, July 25th, about six weeks from now. Monday, July 24th, excuse me. Monday, July 24th, for six weeks, we're going to have a class here teaching these five things. Please, somebody say amen to that. Now, listen, you can stay home and watch... Um, the cornhole championships that are going to be going on, the preseason football games that will be happening that Monday night. You can stay home and, and be in the, in the softball league. You can do all those things. Or you can invest in yourself and invest in your family to become the man that God's called you to be. And as God has called you to do these things, you making a sacrifice to be in this is going to allow you to see how to completely and, and practically apply these principles to your daily life. Now, now I know what you're already thinking, eh, I'm not going to do that. That's not right. You're already not submitting. You're already not saying you start over. 
you're already saying, well, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna submit, I'm not gonna stay, I'm not gonna do those things. That's fine. God has his hand on you. But if you want to move in, if you want to do better, if you want to see God start doing something in your life, it's going to take the men of God to stand up. You didn't hear what I said. The women will follow. God doesn't have to call the women, not because they're second class, because seemingly they have more sense than we do. But if he calls and repairs and restores the men, the women will follow, the children will follow, the blessings will follow, and you're going to learn how to be the man God has called you to be. Now give the Lord a hand clap in his house. Amen. <clears throat> you can go to our, our uh, Planning Center church page on, on the app, and, and you're going to get a little piece of paper, and you can scan that with the QR code, and all you have to do is sign up. Those are going to be in the back. You can get one of those. I know the Lord's going to put it on your heart, and God's going to do good things in you. Amen? Amen. Stand up to your feet. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father. <clears throat> Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father. Thank you for your goodness. Thank you for your grace. If there's a young man standing by you, if there's an old man standing by you, if there's a medium man standing by you. Put your hands on him and let's pray. Let's pray for the men of this church. Let's pray for the men of this church. Come on. Come on. Come on. Let's pray. Listen. The man that you're laying hands on has made mistakes. No one's going to say amen. You're going to tell him in the car. You might as well say amen now. You know what? He's made mistakes. He's made mistakes as a father. He's made mistakes as a son. He's made mistakes as a husband. We make mistakes. But God still has his hand on him, and that means God still has his hand on you. And I want us to pray this prayer together right now. Let's pray for our men. Say, dear Jesus, right now, I bring this man before you. Thank you so much for him. Thank you for his, your image coming out of him. Now pray this prayer and mean it. Say, I forgive him for the dumb things he's done. And I believe you have a plan for him. Help me support him to manifest all you have. And in Jesus' name, kindness, grace, staying, serving, sacrificing, starting over is going to flow through him and our whole family. In Jesus' name. Come on.